Kevin, otherwise known as Forum BX257, here to be another old G.I. Joe toy review. And today I'll be doing one of my most requested of the G.I. Joe vehicles, especially out of the ones that I've just gotten. The G.I. Joe Assault and Transport Helicopter, the 1986 Tomahawk and its pilot lift ticket. Now, the Tomahawk and lift ticket both make their first appearance in the comic books in issue 49. In the cartoon, they make their first appearance in the season opener, the five-part miniseries Arise, Serpentor, Arise, in the very first part. A lot of people tend to think that the Tomahawk really borrows a lot from the CH-46 Sea Knight helicopter, and I can see that. It's a, it's a very compact design. Of course, it has these very small fuel tanks right above the rear landing gear, and, and it only has three landing gear, just like the Sea Knight. However, it, it borrows from a lot of different military helicopters, such as the big wraparound windshield, the weapons pylons on the front, and the, the big open gunship doors, and of course these very prominent stabilizers at the back. Just the airframe alone, the, the body I should say, is around 21 inches long. But with the blades attached, both on the front and on the back, you're looking at around 31 inches long. So be sure to make some prominent room on your shelf if you want to get one of these. Now Lift Ticket probably gets his code name from the pass you would use to ride a ski lift up a mountain for skiing, which means that Lift Ticket is literally the Joe's ride to get up and out of a combat zone or into one. And lastly, Lift Ticket's real name is Victor Sikorsky. Sikorsky probably being an allusion to the Sikorsky Aircraft Company, which is of course the makers of the very first military helicopters. Oddly enough, Sikorsky does not make the CH-46. As mentioned previously, the Tomahawk has these really long big blades and I've removed two of them from each of the rotors just so that they aren't bumping into me. The blades themselves are not designed to be removable however, so if yours are kind of uh, hard or very difficult to get out, I suggest not taking them out altogether because they can't snap. Now I have the rest of them here so there would have been 10 individual blades altogether and you do have to kind of hold them by this nub piece and not the blade part because this is actually where it's most likely to snap because this is as you can see very very thin plastic. It's also susceptible to drooping unfortunately which is one of the reasons why most people try to take them off in the first place. You can, of course, just reverse them and put them on upside down so that you can let gravity re-straighten the blades. If you thought the number of blades was excessive, the Tomahawk also has five removable engine covers. There's two big ones right on the top here. And even though it has these rather exposed nubs on the top, these, are, these actually act as hinges. So you're actually supposed to take them off from here. You're supposed to lift from the bottom here and lift a little bit up and then out. And the same thing with the other side. And that reveals a ton of detail as well as the exhaust pipes on the front. And because those are now off, you're free to take this front cowling off. And again, you have to lift it off sort of forward, and there's a sort of a, I guess a plug or hinge there. And that comes off, and you can see the engine detail for the intakes. On the back, we have yet more engine detail. And again, it's almost natural to try and take the panel off from the top, but you're actually supposed to take it off from underneath. And the same thing with the other side. The Tomahawk also features a canopy which flips forward on a very small hinge here. On the inside we have a spacious interior which has room for two G.I. Joes. 
and the figures are actually kind of held in by these tiny little throttles so they actually flip up over the figure's lap and that's really what holds them in. As for weaponry, the Tomahawk has two winglet pylons on either side with six of these small little bombs. I'll just remove this so you can see it better. Each side has one large missile which tabs in into this suppression on the side of the fuselage. The doors, or rather doorways, have two swiveling non-removable machine guns unfortunately. And they're sort of angled downwards, meaning that these are armaments which are only supposed to be used when the helicopter is in flight. And of course my favorite arm armament, the chin gun, which has a big multi-barreled machine gun that swivels and elevates. And as you can see the camera or aiming scope actually moves along with the machine gun in synchronization. Which I think is pretty cool. The interior has five seats which are removable. They come off with just these little pegs. You can take them all completely out and just put cargo in there if you don't want personnel. Oddly enough, to access that you have a loading ramp. But the loading ramp actually has a very narrow, very oddly shaped bay. It's, it's accurate to this type of helicopter, but I don't see anything other than personnel using this rather than vehicles. And speaking of the rear quarters, the rear has yet another rotor. This one actually pivots from side to side and has actually a rather large knob. So if you want to, you can spin this around. On the bottom, we have three sets of landing gear. These are rubber tires, which is rather nice. There are also a rather substantial struts on here, so you don't have to worry about breaking these things off. They seem rather sturdy to me. And of course, on the bottom, we have a rescue winch. As you can see, this thing has a almost pretty much almost a standard, standard hook on here. And this is the same hook that was used on the 1983 Dragonfly, as well as the 1985 Transportable Tactical Battle Platform. It's attached by a rope. It has actually a very flat knob here, which is nice because it's not obviously a knob. You don't really see it when the helicopter is in profile, which is nice. It's sort of hidden. And of course, you just you, you wind it up or you loosen it out. And you have quite a long string in there. Yet another nice thing about this is that this whole section actually comes out pretty freely so that if the rope is kinked up in there or if you've gotten dirt in there it's actually pretty easy just to remove this whole thing and rewind it or clean it. And now to take a look at the Tomahawk's pilot lift ticket is actually a very well sculpted figure. He has a lot of detail and a lot of it actually seems quite accurate to how a helicopter pilot actually would look. Fortunately Lift ticket only comes with one accessory, which is the infamous microphone, which to me is a very, well, rather unnecessary part of this figure. He, he has enough detail on his face. You don't really need this extra little bit sticking out, and it's fairly easy just to pop it off and lose it within the cockpit of the Tomahawk. He is affectionately known as Old Football Head to, for some collectors because of the shape of his helmet, but as I just said, I think that's actually fairly accurate to how personnel would have actually looked back then. So how does he stack up to the other helicopter pilot? Wild Bill is, well, very a very stylized character. And let's face it, I think his outfit is way more influenced by the Vietnam conflict rather than something from the 1980s era. So we're really comparing apples and oranges here.
Well, that's all the time I have right now. Please check out my Facebook page for more information and behind the scenes photos for these reviews. Thank you for watching this video and stay tuned for next time to see another 1980s G.I. Joe tour review. See you then.